be live in five. Well, good morning all and welcome to our Providence Medical Grand Rounds. We'll start with just a couple announcements. First off, next week we'll be hearing from Dr. Nick Cockler. He will be giving the talk 10 years of clinical ethical consultation at Providence 2010 to 2020, a retrospective analysis. And we are here on the team's live platform. You can earn CME credit for watching here live virtually or also by watching the recording of today's session. We'll send a follow-up email uh, later today where you can claim your CME credit. I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A throughout today's session, so please go ahead and post any comments or questions for our speaker. I'll hold most of the questions until the end as time permits. And now to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Una Miniter. She's a practicing dermatologist with Providence Medical Group at the Clackamas location. Dr. Miniter earned her medical degree from Loyola University, did her internship at McNeil Memorial Hospital in Illinois, and then residency in dermatology at OHSU. Dr. Miniter is well known for her outstanding, particularly patient-centered care. She's also a skilled teacher, and we are so grateful for her willingness to come join us today. Thanks, Dr. Miniter. I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me to come give this lecture. Um, a second time, I originally gave this lecture back in February um, at the primary care conference. So um, sorry for those who might be hearing it for a second time, but hopefully we'll um, pick up something new. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, and I hope that you can hear me well. Um, they are doing quite a bit of yard work, I think, outside my office now. So I'll try to speak up. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, I feel very grateful for um, having been asked to give this lecture again. Um, you know, I graduated about eight years ago um, and through the, uh, sorry, about five years ago and over the past eight years as a dermatology resident and now as an, a practicing dermatologist, um, you know, I've seen the diagnoses of patients with black and brown skin um, be delayed or missed. Um, and myself included in that group, um, not due to the lack of exposure and knowledge, um, due to the lack of exposure and knowledge on the part of the dermatologist or other physician. Um, having trained in and graduated from a location that primarily sees white skin five years ago, um, I have made it a priority in my post-residency years to kind of decrease my own significant knowledge gap um, in dermatologic evaluation and treatment um, in individuals with skin of color. Um, using kind of the knowledge gained through lectures, conferences, textbooks written by individuals with skin of color, um, I humbly present you uh, with the following information. And hopefully someday um, a lecture of this type will no longer be necessary um, and that all dermatologic lectures and textbooks will represent skin of color and uh, light skin to an equal degree. Um, if you do have any questions or concerns, you know, through this lecture, please let me know. All right. OK, so uh, who is this lecture um, about? So while skin of color may suggest a single entity, um, this could not be further from the case. Um, Dr. Susan Taylor, who is an expert in the field of skin of color, writes in her textbook, Dermatology and Skin of Color, that patients with skin of color represent a diverse population of different races and ancestral origins, as well as multiple ethnicities. The study of this group involves understanding of common and unique disorders that disproportionately affect them, in addition to understanding the cultural underpinning of disease development in this population. Thus, the subspecialty of skin of color is used to bring together patients, clinicians, and scientists interested in the treatment and investigation of disorders that occur in these individuals. Um, according in a more general sense, according to the US Census, this may include the following demographic groups. However, in a more um, specific dermatologic and medical sense, um, skin of color is often referred to as uh, according to the Fitzpatrick skin types. Um, as you can see here, um, the Fitzpatrick skin types range from one to six um, with um, lighter skin 
uh, skin tones referring to types one and two, um, and sometimes three, and then types four through six representing um, classically skin of color. While this may seem like an objective physical exam finding, it's actually more um, accurately defined as the skin reaction to the sun, where on one end skin type one always freckles, always burns, peels, never tans, to skin type six, which never freckles, almost never burns, and always tans. So you'll hear me speaking about Fitzpatrick skin types very frequently during this lecture, and most commonly four through six um, for individuals with skin of color. Um, it's important to note that by 2020, by 2044, individuals with skin of color, four through six, um, will, um, will represent um, more than half of the US population. So this is of utmost importance. Um, so um, I'm going to move on now just briefly. I wish you know there could be a whole series of lectures on this topic, but someday um, this will this grading system on the eight types of human hair will be as well known as the Fitzpatrick skin color types. Um, this study, which was published uh, as a collaboration in between Chicago and a group in France, um, measures four per parameters related to hair curliness. It measures curve diameter, curl index, and then kinking of the hair, which is the number of waves and the number of twists in a hair. Um, and this was actually um, over approximately 2,500 subjects were um, used within this trial and kind of boiled down um, human hair to eight types. And this is very important um, because different um, hair conditions are more common in, in various hair types. Um, and this will be very important in the future doing research studies as instead of referring to very unclear kind of ancestral or ethnic origins of subjects, we can use a numerical grading scale. So brief aside, so first of all, in order to discuss um, this, it's very important that we each recognize our own gaps in knowledge in uh, dermatologic manifestations in skin of color and how that might relate to delays in diagnoses and misdiagnoses in these individuals. So uh, first step in solving any problem is recognizing the problem. Um, as physicians know or are coming to know, there is a stagger staggering number of health disparities between individuals with FITS types one through three and FITS types four through six. Um, the field of dermatology is unfortunately no different. There are numerous studies, three of which listed here, um, that um, indicate higher rates of misdiagnoses, missed diagnoses, or uh, worse treatment outcomes um, in individuals with ato atopic dermatitis, acne, melanoma, and non-melanoma skin cancers in individuals with skin of color. Non-white um, patients have higher rates of morbidity and mortality associated with dermatologic disease than their white counterparts. A lack of diversity in dermatologic me medical education is among the factors that may contribute to this disparity. Traditionally, dermatologic education in medical school and residency has been heavily biased uh, towards white skin, if included in the curriculum at all. Um, this bias, along with clinicians' overall unawareness of this educational lapse, may lead to poor confidence in evaluating individuals with skin of color. Um, it leads to lower recognition rates of dermatologic pathology um, and a lack of awareness that one maybe should even be examining individuals um, uh, with skin of color. And this definitely contributes to poorer outcomes in, in non-white patients. Um, the paper published here, Dr. Forniquet, um, goes on to describe that af after specific education on selected skin diseases in skin of color, both physicians and learners, um, like medical students can increase their diagnostic accuracy um, and confidence and provide hopefully this evidence-based hopeful pathway to, rem to remedy this education gap. Um, going on here, um, this, fly this slide further highlights kind of that former paper's points. Um, the top left study, which discusses medical students' ability to diagnose common dermatologic conditions in skin of color, um, highlights that uh, medical students were less accurate in diagnosing squamous cell carcinoma 
atopic dermatitis and urticaria or hives in individuals with skin of color, um, although they were more uh, accurate in diagnosing something such as tinea versicolor in, in skin of color. The second paper um, discusses um, skin of color education specifically in dermatologic residency programs. Um, it, and I can attest to this as well, um, that exposure to, um, if, to dermatology residents uh, to skin of color images is much less common. Um, it also highlights that the dermatology as a field is not diverse. Um, uh, Black Americans and Latinx um, dermatologists represent only 3% and 4.2% respectively of all dermatologists while comprising 13 and a half and 18% of the US population. Just to put that in perspective, there is one black board certified dermatologist in the city of San Francisco, and there is one black board certified dermatologist in the state of Oregon. Dermatology is the second to last in terms of diversity, just in front of orthopedic surgery. Um, the most diverse fields of medicine being internal medicine and pediatrics. These discrepancies between the general population and the composition of the dermatology workforce is widening, and over time, um, it seems to be worsening. Um, to help remedy this problem, Dr. Susan Taylor, um, who is a very eminent uh, figure and um, dermatologist in the field of skin of color, has started this movement about 20 years ago to increase the awareness of the lack of skin of color in medical school and residencies. Um, so she started the, the first of her kind at Penn. And then if you see on the right, this was a paper published um, that has shown uh, 16 more academic training centers that have set up um, uh, skin of color centers at their, at their uh, universities. And since this paper was published, Dr. Jenna Luster, who is a skin of color expert at UCSF, has set one up um, um, at UCSF. And so to where we are now, that is the closest um, skin of color center uh, to, um, to the state of Oregon. The goals of these uh, centers are to um, increase research, increase care for individuals with skin of color, and prepare residents to treat them, and also to educate the medical community as well as the public at large. Um, the hope is that these organizations, um, these types of um, clinics will increase in number and that all academic centers will have one at their residency programs. Um, on the left is the American Academy of Dermatology's programs that have been started um, somewhat recently, the Diversity Mentoring Mentorship Program, as well as Diversity Champions, which um, aim to increase diversity in the dermatologic workforce starting as young as elementary school. Um, so moving on to my second objective um, is to identify a few select skin conditions and skin of color. Um, so to re a review of the National Ambulatory Care Survey, which provides the you know, primary diagnoses for dermatologists organized by race and ethnicity from 1993 to 2009, suggests that about 50% of the most frequent 10 cutaneous diagnoses in the US are shared regardless of racial racial origin. So for example, acne is the first or second diagnosis um, uh, or reason why a person would seek dermatologic care regardless of their ethnicity or culture. Some skin disorders do disproportionately affect certain populations with skin of color, however. And in some disorders, a significant disparity exists in health outcomes. Highlighting these disparities, I think my light turned off, um, highlights, um, okay, yep. Um, um, can hi highlighting these disparities empowers clinicians to improve outcomes in these groups. Um, so conditions um, with an increased incidence in uh, black Americans compared to white Americans include atopic dermatitis, cutaneous T cell lymphoma, sarcoidosis, keloids, hydratinitis separativa, pseudofolliculitis barbae, acne keloidalis nuke, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, 
systemic lupus, dermatomyositis, systemic sclerosis, and melasma. Uh, due to the brevity of this lecture, though, I can only focus on three of these conditions. So the first um, is a pseudofolliculitis barbae, sometimes referred to as um, uh, PSB. So this is an inflammatory skin condition of the hair-bearing areas that is incited by shaving. The close shaving of curly hair causes the hair to penetrate the wall of the hair follicle and extend into the dermis and grow back or to curve upon itself and pierce the skin. This is almost always a clinical diagnosis and biopsy is rarely necessary. Things that can exacerbate this condition include shaving with multiple bladed razors, picking out the hairs with tweezers, shaving against the grain of hair growth, and pulling the skin taut while shaving. So the exam here shows numerous perifollicular um, erythematous to hyperpigmented to violaceous uh, papules and pustules, sometimes with a background of hyperpigmentation. Um, individuals on the left, which is uh, fits type four, um, you can see that the erythema is, is slightly less appreciated um, and you can see more violaceous color and more hyperpigmentation. A deeper skin tone on the right, Fitzpatrick 5, um, shows even less notable violaceous color and more hyperpigmentation. This is in contrast to a Fitzpatrick skin type 3, showing that, that more um, noticeable erythema um, um, than violaceous color. Um, uh, we see this in the beard distribution with often a notable sparing of the mustache area. Um, this photograph shows not only the hyperpigmented to violaceous perifollicular papules, um, but significant post-inflammatory pigment alteration, which is known as PIPA. Notice the word alteration. That can be referred to as hyperpigmentation or hypo or lightening of the skin. Um, the PIPA is much more common in individuals with skin of color. Um, to try to prevent the hyperpigmentation from occurring, um, you know, as well as to prevent this condition in general, ideally a person should stop shaving. However, that's not always possible. Think police officers, military members, or is it desired? Um, so it would be good to recommend um, soaking the face with a warm wet washcloth for at least 10 minutes prior to shaving, um, warming the um, shaving gels um, or shaving razors, and usually using specialized sensitive skin uh, shaving gels and specialized razors to allow for a less close shave. We, like I said previously, we want to shave in the direction of hair growth without pulling the skin taut, using a sharp single bladed razor or an electric razor on the closest or highest setting. Avoid shaving over the same area twice. You can tell your patients that it's okay to lift a hair, uh, embedded hair out of the hair follicle, but avoid plucking it out as that can exacerbate the problem. Um, here's another really beautiful close up photograph, really accentuating those hyperpigmented. You can really see those perifollicular um, papules, uh, discrete papules there. Um, treatment of this condition includes a hydrocortisone 1% cream applied immediately after shaving, topical clindamycin 1% lotion or gel or solution applied twice a day. Um, we want to use an over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide 5 to 10% wash used anywhere between five and seven days a week, depending on how irritating that makes a certain person's skin. You can use Topical tretinoin, also known as Retin-A, 0.025 to 0.1% cream. And in severe cases, you can add in oral doxycycline, you know, depending on the severity of the condition. Some skin of color specialists will even recommend what's known as the chemical depilatory agents or PACE. Um, these contain calcium thioglycolate. Um, and these are pastes that you or creams that you can apply and leave in, in place for a certain number of minutes, certainly no more than 10 minutes, no matter what it is, and rinse off. And that can help rinse away the hair and avoid shaving entirely. However, there is a somewhat high rate of irritant contact dermatitis that can happen with these agents. So care should be taken to adhere 
to the um, to the the instructions uh, very strictly for fear of inducing a worsening of the post inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Um, of course, laser hair removal at a dermatologic or plastic surgery office that's experienced in treating skin of color can be very highly effective in preventing um, this disorder. Um, lasers such as Q-switched ND YAG are most appropriate for individuals with skin of color. Um, Dr. Jenna Lester, who I mentioned previously, who started the Skin of Color Clinic at um, UCSF, um, uh, recommended um, uh, several of what I several of the things I just mentioned. So credit should be given to her. Um, a very highly overlapping condition is uh, with pseudofolliculitis barbae is acne keloidalis nuke. So the top left photo shows pseudofolliculitis barbae, and the following uh, three show almost an identical pathogenically related disorder um, called acne keloidalis nuke, with more prominent um, keloid or scar formation on the um, posterior neck and occipital scalp. Um, it's very important to treat um, all of these conditions aggressively for fear of developing this permanent um, kind of keloidal scarring. Um, several other uh, complications can result um, from untreated pseudofolliculitis barbae, such as, you know, not only scarring and hyperpigmentation, but also bacterial and fungal infections, um, which I'll highlight in a moment. Um, and treatment for acne keloidalis nuke is almost identical to pseudofolliculitis barbae. So this, I love this photograph, um, and to give credit to several of these photographs are taken from um, the Skin of Color Library on the Visual DX um, tool, um, and you can see that down in the bottom right. Um, but this photograph um, I love because it, it really beautifully shows um, pseudofolliculitis barbae, those violaceous hyperpigmented papules, some background hyperpigmentation, and then also, if you look closely, you can see these annular kind of hyperpigmented, um, slightly scaly um, to violaceous plaques um, in that same beard area. And that represents um, tinea barbae or a dermatified infection of the beard area. So not only would this person be treated with topical clindamycin, over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide wash, topical retinoid, but we also would want to treat them with an oral Lamisil, you know, 250 milligrams a day um, for four to six weeks, depending on how they do. And after that tinea barbe has cleared, you could also consider adding in a prescription for a 4% hydroquinone, which is a skin lightening agent. Um, that is a very important tool in individuals with um, skin of color condition, skin conditions. Pseudofolliculitis barbae, barbae of course refers to the beard area, but pseudofolliculitis in general can of course occur in the genital region um, or in the axillary region or really anywhere that curly hair is shaved. And that is also uh, treated exactly the same as what I just mentioned. So here not, um, not only highlights classic pseudofolliculitis barbae, but also is in um, unfortunately accompanied by keloidal or thickened scarring, um, which I'm sure you've all seen keloid scarring. Um, it is this benign kind of overgrowth of dense fibrous tissue that develops as a result of even very minor cutaneous injury, and it spreads beyond the site of the initial injury. Um, surgeries, burns, and really any inflammatory condition of the skin can lead to this condition. These do not regress spontaneously, and keloids can be extremely disfiguring and even limit joint mobility in certain individuals if placed in, the, in a bad spot. Um, they can cause significant impairment in quality of life. Um, it's unclear why a high risk exists in individuals with Fitzpatrick skin types four through six, but of course, you know, genetic predisposition is often theorized. Um, in addition to aggressive treatment of pseudofolliculitis barbae in this individual, I, as a dermatologist, I would also treat with, um, uh, if patient was, was up for it, you know, injections of a low strength intralesional uh, Kenalog um, on a serial basis until improvement was seen. 
So moving on to my next condition, which is more common in individuals with skin of color, is of course atopic dermatitis, often commonly simply known as eczema. We know this, it presents as scaly, erythematous, sometimes hyperpigmented or violaceous, uh, papules, plaques, uh, classically on the flexural surfaces, particular the particularly the antecubital fossa, popliteal fossa, face and neck, extremities in general. Um, black children in America are six times more likely to develop uh, severe atopic dermatitis than white children in America. Um, and this leads to a greater um, um, uh, worsening in their quality of life, even leading to a statistically significant increased risk of school absences in individuals with skin of color who have atopic dermatitis. Um, so in the, the in skin of color, the erythema, as you might notice here in the kind of um, in, well, maybe all of the photos, that the erythema is significantly less noticeable um, and we see more of this hyperpigmented, violaceous, and, um, and lichenified or kind of thickening with increased skin lines um, more visible. Um, this almost gives the appearance that their atopic dermatitis is more well, well demarcated and that often can lead to a misdiagnosis of atopic dermatitis in this group. Um, these are closer up photographs, which highlights a Fitzpatrick skin type four on the left and five on the right. Um, a top severe atopic dermatitis showing scaliness, lichenification, um, violaceous uh, color more, more seen on the left and hyperpigmented more seen on the right. Um, and a very important clinical subtype that you've probably already seen in your patients with skin of color who have atopic dermatitis is this follicular eczema subtype. We have these scaly, really follicular-based um, papules. Um, in Fitzpatrick 1 through 3, you may see these follicular papules, um, a follicular eczema being more skin-colored or erythematous. And then in types 4 through 6, we see them being violaceous, hyperpigmented. And look at this really great, um, uh, really cool close-up photograph you could see with a magnifying glass or just really close visualization. Um, and you can see these kind of uh, subtle, um, you know, follicular-based papules. Um, here, uh, really great photographs of contrasting follicular-based uh, predominantly follicular-based eczema in a person with Fitzpatrick skin type 4 to 5, um, the hyperpigmentation kind of over the joints there. Um, and then on the right side, we have more of a extensor um, accentuated atopic dermatitis. You can see that hyperpigmentation in photo exposed areas, as well as just that more notable kind of deep erythema um, kind of in the more photoprotected areas. Um, it's important to note these erosions, um, which can be present in subacute eczema, which is often very highly um, uh, related to super, super infection, often colonization um, with staph bacteria, which is very common in individuals um, with uh, atopic dermatitis. Perfect. So in this photograph here, um, we see that pigmentary changes are more prominent in FITS types four through six, um, and, and that includes not only post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but also hypo, so less pigmentation, and depigmentation, so total apps of, depig of pigmentation. This is more uh, commonly present in chronic, um, you know, untreated atopic dermatitis, we can see the lichenification or accentuation of the, the skin lines on the bilateral ankles and then the dorsal hands. People should be counseled that with aggressive treatment, we usually can get some of the hyperpigmentation to fade over several months to years, but the depigmentation um, can often be permanent. So I wanted to show this, um, this person's skin who has very severe atopic dermatitis, um, often referred to as almost erythrodermic um, atopic dermatitis, but you can kind of note the absence of, of erythema in this person. This person is actually FITS type 
five, but appears to have a Fitz type skin, six skin, because his only manifestation of his eczema is just this total and diffuse hyperpigmentation. So this should not be underestimated. This is very severe atopic dermatitis and needs to be treated aggressively. We see um, superficial desquamation, we can see hyperpigmentation, we see the lichenification on the hands. So other classic features of atopic dermatitis here show hyperlinear palms on the left or accentuated skin lines on the hands. On the right, we see notable um, hyperpigmentation uh, on the face as well as that periocular region. This person has severe atopic dermatitis. This is not treated and we're waiting for it to get better. This needs to be treated aggressively. This photo highlights the headlamp sign, um, which in atopic dermatitis refers to that accentuation of the eczema hyperpigmentation seen here around the eyes and on that upper lip with notable sparing of the more sebaceous uh, nose. So lastly, the third um, condition that I will discuss today that's more common in individuals with skin of color is melasma. Um, this is an acquired disorder of hyperpigmentation that affects the sun exposed areas of the face. Usually it's symmetric, um, is more common in women, but can occur in men. Um, and especially women of Latinx and individuals of Asian descent. Um, melasma is rare before puberty. Um, and here, really great photographs showing classic melasma. It has that kind of a regular border. Um, it's usually evenly pigmented, so either light or medium to dark brown throughout with very little variegation in that brown color. Um, it has this what they call a moth-eaten border, kind of that irregular border. Um, contributing factors to the development of melasma include thyroid autoimmunity, ultraviolet radiation, sunlight, hyperestrogenism such as pregnancy or oral contraceptive pills, of course genetic factors, and even anti-epileptic medications. The classic locations are the upper lip, the cheeks, the forehead, um, and actually the dorsal forearms, which is a very underestimated um, area, but common of melasma. The frequency of melasma in um, you know, certain high-risk groups can be anywhere between a quarter of a percent to up to 4%. So I don't want to split hairs here, but there's actually two forms of melasma. There's epidermal melasma, where the pigmentation is in the epidermis, seen above, and um, dermal melasma seen below where the pigmentation is deeper, it's in the dermis. Um, as a diagnostic tool, if you happen to have a woods lamp in your office or a black light, um, epidermal melasma can be highlighted or it will appear darker when using a woods lamp, whereas dermal melasma will not be highlighted. It should be um, important to counsel patients that Melasma as in general is very difficult to treat, can be very treatment refractory, and is even more difficult in individuals with the dermal variant of melasma. To the naked eye, of course, these can look identical. So here are more photographs, really illustrating the, the beautiful symmetry that, um, that melasma can show, as well as to illustrate a man who um, has melasma. He does not have any hormonal, you know, abnormalities or conditions, this can simply occur um, in men. So of course melasma is benign, but it causes significant emotional distress, um, poor quality of life scores. Sun avoidance is absolutely critical for these individuals. So broad spectrum sunscreen, um, protecting against UVA and UVB, as well as visible light um, with an SPF 30 or higher uh, is absolutely imperative. Uh, sun protective hats, clothing is essential. Um, just a brief aside, oral contraceptive pill induced melasma can be very difficult to treat whether OCPs are discontinued or not. So I would make that counseling point to your patients as well. Um, melasma induced by pregnancy does usually fade within about a year of delivery. So the first line treatment um, for this is a skin lightening agent known as hydroquinone, 4%.
it should be applied to the hyperpigmented areas. Um, hydroquinone can also be combined um, with um, topical tretinoin or retin-A, kojic acid, and a very low strength topical steroid. It's important to not use hydroquinone uh, continuously as it can paradoxically cause worsening in dark pigmentation as a condition known as ochronosis. So for example, I will often instruct my patients to use hydroquinone you know, three months on, three months in a row, and then take two months off to avoid the development of ochronosis. You should counsel them that it can take up to six to 12 months of strict sun protection in addition to treatment to see improvement in this kind of refractory condition. Of course, things like lasers, chemical peels, microdermabrasion can be done, but only by a dermatologist um, or plastic surgeon that is experienced in treating skin of color so that we avoid that high risk for um, post-inflammatory pig pigment alteration or hyperpigmentation. Um, Individuals with skin of color may often prefer sunscreens that contain um, mineral-based uh, mineral um, ingredient known as iron oxide, which can help decrease that really white cast um, that can be seen in many physical blocker sunscreens. So interestingly, a newer um, study, it was a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study looking at transexamic acid um, has shown um, success in the treatment of moderate to severe melasma. Um, that is 250 milligrams twice a day. This study, they did combine that, of course, with sunscreen, um, but this did statistically um, um, uh, in decrease the severity of melasma with very minimal side effects. So my final objective um, will be to review uh, the more commonly misdiagnosed dermatologic issues um, uh, in skin of color. Um, so this, I love this slide, the side-to-side -side comparison. Both of these individuals have disseminated meningococcemia, right? On the right, we see that violaceous, um, dusky, um, probably tender to palpation plaques on, um, you can see that pink, you know, color. Or on the left, this person has the same condition, but they maybe have you know, subtle edema, you're going to have to feel for that warmth um, and that edema. Um, you see more of that hyperpigmentation um, and, you know, they will still also, of course, be, be tender to palpation. So it's so important to look, um, to feel, to use your lighting um, in order to not miss um, or even delay a diagnosis of a very serious condition. This also um, shows uh, this shows leukocytoclastic vasculitis or cutaneous small vessel vasculitis, an individual with its type one to two on the right and type, um, you know, four to five on the left. On the left, we're going to see, you know, that more deep uh, violaceous color. Um, on the right, um, more of the, um, uh, you know, erythema um, pink color. Both will be non-blanching or maybe just partially blanching. Um, of course, this is, you know, usually a more subacute process, but um, it's still important to consider this and know what this looks like in an individual with skin of color. Of course, we reviewed this at, you know, at length, but this is an individual. Both have severe atopic dermatitis. One uh, on the left with more hyperpigmented, more violaceous, more like kinification visible. One on the right with more um, erythema um, uh, scale, less visible iconification, um, both should be treated the same. Um, here again, really illustrates that um, periocular erythema and lichenification. Um, I think sometimes what can happen is we see an individual on the left where we just see the hyperpigmentation and we tend to think that, oh, this is no longer active inflammation. That is not always correct. We need to elicit a history of, is this still itchy? We need to feel for warmth. We need to assess for spreading and worsening, and both need to be treated um, uh, appropriately. I love this photograph. So urticaria, of course, 
um, much more common. You know, one of the more common things that we see in in dermatology, and I'm sure in primary care as well. But you can see how strikingly visible this may be on a very white skinned individual, really well demarcated, edematous, um, kind of wheels, plaques, non scaly. Whereas on the left, if you really have to look close, you have to see um, on that clavicle region on the shoulder, we have that edema. And then this photograph here, which I absolutely love, beautiful photo shows that um, uh, side lighting. So I want you to have, you know, a little flashlight or a magnifier with a light that shows that edema. You can even press your finger um, against the skin and release to really identify any uh, blanching erythema um, and that really peau d'orange kind of change, obviously more easily visible on the right, but also if looked closely with good lighting, you can see that on the on the left. Um, so um, a dermatology lecture not complete unless we of course discuss melanoma. So thankfully, melanoma represents a very small proportion of skin, skin colors seen in all racial groups, but does account for 75% of all skin cancer deaths. An inverse relationship exists between melanoma incidence and degree of skin pigmentation. The incidence is highest amongst um, individuals with its types one and two, with a rate of about 31 per 100,000, intermediate amongst Latinx, or more appropriately stated, you know, fits three and four, um, and then has a lowest incidence in Fitzpatrick types five and six, with an incidence of 1.1 per 100,000. Melanoma tends to occur in um, in sun exposed areas in individuals with type fits types one through three, and more on acral or hand and foot sites um, um, in Fitzpatrick five and six with up to 50 to 70% of black Americans with melan developing with melanoma developing on their hands or their feet. That is huge. Um, the reason for this is still unknown um, and controversial. Um, of note, melanoma is caught later, the tumors are thicker, higher rate of metastasis, and of course a worse overall prognosis, significantly lower five-year melanoma survival rate, in individuals with Fitzpatrick skin types um, five and six. So, you know, it can't be accentuated enough to examine the hands, the feet, and then I'll show later, you know, in a second, the genital region and the mouth as part of a skin exam in individuals with skin of color. So um, here uh, shows um, melanoma in the mucosal surface. Um, it is proportionately more common in individuals with skin of color, which emphasizes the importance of these exams as part of a total body skin exam. Subungal melanoma, which means melanoma from uh, deriving from um, the nail unit, nail bed or nail matrix. In two thirds of cases of, of subungal melanoma, um, it will present as a solitary brown or black longitudinal or uh, lengthwise uh, along the nail, a pigmented band um, known um, in medical speak as Melaninichia striata. Melanoma will most commonly be greater than three millimeters in width, have an irregular or blurred border, and decrease um, uh, distally, decrease in width distally. So you can see that kind of triangle here um, on the bottom right with the positive Hutchinson sign, which is pigmentation affecting here the proximal nail fold, or if it's more advanced, the distal nail fold. Um, melanoma is um, will come up more often um, as a new pigmented band in an individual over 50. Um, they can be homo homogeneously black or kind of variegated or multicolored brown. Um, I absolutely love the photo on the right because it just shows this incidental subungal hematoma on that um, thumb, um, which you know may be confusing for a melanoma, but you'll notice that over a four-week observation period, that thumbnail that will that patch will grow out, whereas of course the pigmented band will only worsen. Um, ulcerated 
you know, you're, we're of course not going to miss biopsying this ulcerative tumor, but it's just to really highlight how if you have a person with a pigmented band, it doesn't grow out over a four week um, period of time. Um, they really should be referred to um, plastic surgery, hand surgery. Some of us dermatologists will biopsy the nails, um, you know, for a biopsy. Um, while still under investigation, UV radiation does appear to play only a minor role in the development of melanoma in individual with FITS types five and six. But here we do have, you know, melanomas occurring in more sun exposed areas. Um, but non sun exposed areas that are important to watch for, as I've mentioned, the palms, the soles, the mucosal surfaces. Other reported risk factors for melanoma in individuals with FITS types five and six include albinism, burn scars, radiation treatment, chronic repetitive physical trauma, immunosuppression, and a pre existing mole on the acral or mucosal surface surfaces. Studies show that over 90% of black Americans have at least one mole. So it's not, it's very common for individuals to have moles. So we should be checking. Um, um, and these moles in black American individuals, according to this study, were um, most commonly on the hands and the feet. So despite so OK, and moving on. So despite low, very um, lower rates of squamous cell carcinomas in individuals with darker skin types, squamous cell carcinomas um, will, uh, will um, cause increased suffering, greater morbidity and mortality in individuals with darker skin. Squamous cell carcinoma is the most common um, skin cancer type in um, black skin. Um, and it's the second most type of skin cancer in individuals of Asian descent. Squamous cell carcinoma in skin of color tends to occur again in more non sun exposed sites, although it can occur as sun ex exposed sites. And in some studies have a quoted mortality rate as high as 29%, which is awful, uh, presumably because of delays in diagnosis. So the photograph on the bottom left shows a squamous cell carcinoma developing in a chronic burn scar, which is often referred to as a Margellan's ulcer. Top right photograph shows an ulcerated squamous cell carcinoma at the oral commissure, possibly an immunosuppressed individual as this individual looks quite young. Um, central lower photograph so shows a verrucous squamous cell carcinoma, um, which uh, is on the penis. Um, and this is thought to be theorized um, from um, chronic HPV infection in this region. The um, photograph of the scalp um, on the bottom right shows this kind of eroded, ill-defined, hypopigmented, erythematous, scaly plaque, which probably was misdiagnosed as an infection, um, could have resulted from chronic burn as well, but that is also a squamous cell carcinoma. And then lastly, basal cell carcinoma. So basal cell carcinoma is the most common skin cancer type um, in Latinx individuals and individuals of Asian descent, but of course occurs in all skin types. Uh, Fitzpatrick types four through six tend to be present um, um, more, uh, tend to present more commonly with pigmented basal cell carcinomas. So um, here we have kind of a scaly gray kind of plaque on the back, which is a basal cell. On the scalp on the top right, we have these pearly, almost translucent, pa subtle papules on the scalp. The central photo just shows, shows a crusted, skin-colored um, papule on the inferior eyelid. And the bottom right, which you know easily you, you could confuse with a melanoma and of course needs a biopsy, is actually a pigmented basal cell carcinoma as well. So, to wrap up this, this lecture, I would really like to point um, everyone towards more resources. Um, on the left um, shows Dr. Andrew Alexis, who is a prominent um, dermatologist and expert in skin of color. Um, it's his kind of reg recommended atlases showing photographs um, and um, uh, research specifically targeted for individuals with skin of color 
that top photograph, Taylor and Kelly, Dr. Susan Taylor's book is the one that I use and is excellent. Um, the, the resource on the right is the Skin of Color Society and their website has, you know, lectures, um, is really just uh, really a rich resource um, for information for physicians as well as patients um, um, highlighting uh, issues surrounding skin, skin of color. Uh, um, oops, skipped ahead too fast. And then I've mentioned her several times, but um, Dr. Susan Taylor, kind of the mother of this field, um, uh, her textbook is excellent, and she did a collaboration with the Visual DX, which is an incredible online kind of digital resource and has the largest collection of skin of color, um, um, Kodachrome's photographs, research studies, and um, if you do have available CME dollars, you know, investing in this resource is absolutely um, worth it. Um, so um, it has been very enjoyable for me to give this lecture. Here are some more of my references, um, and I'd be happy to um, kind of answer any questions or any concerns um, that people have uh, regarding this topic. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Miniature. Uh, thanks for the introduction, um, as well as those resources for the end uh, to extend our own learning um, and lots of practical information in between. Um, I'll wait for some additional comments and questions to come through. Um, while we wait, could you um, comment again on your recommendation for uh, sunscreen um, for skin of color? And you referenced um, a type that may be preferable and any yes. comments in general on, on sun protection. Yes, yeah. So um, Dr. Jenna Lester at UCSF gave a lecture to the Oregon Dermatology Society back in February that really covered this nicely. So, you know, um, I know I talked about sunscreen in the setting of melasma, but of course, majority of people um, with Fitzpatrick skin types, you know, four through six don't have melasma, you know, so just for, uh, you know, daily kind of sun protection. Um, broadband, um, which means it covers UVA and UVB, um, SPF 30. And then um, above that, special considerations for individuals that really want to avoid that white kind of coloration, which can accompany a lot of the, the mineral-based blockers. The chemical-based sunscreens, while kind of, you know, they're definitely getting a lot more scrutiny these days, um, are not inherently any more dangerous or more safe, you know, than the, the mineral-based sunscreens. So chemical-based sunscreens do definitely rub in, you know, much better and don't leave behind that white cast. Um, and so, you know, um, sunscreens such as, you know, uh, Blue Lizard, Coats, which are Australian brand sunscreens and are some of the best sunscreens, you know, out there. Um, or the, the tinted um, mineral-based sunscreens, and by mineral-based, I mean zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, and then another sunscreen agent, which is technically not approved by the FDA as a sunscreen agent, but is often formulated with uh, zinc and titanium dioxide, is iron oxide. And the iron oxide sunscreens um, help kind of eliminate um, some of that, um, that white cast. And if you simply, you know, you know, go to Google or go to, um, you know, Ulta Beauty. There are so many brands that contain, you know, um, the iron oxide uh, based sunscreens. And we do recommend the physical based sunscreens more commonly for melasma because even strong physical, like visible light um, can darken certain types of melasma. Um, but in individuals who don't have melasma, they'll probably have a much easier time using the chemical-based uh, avobenzone, oxybenzone-based um, sunscreens. And it's important to, um, to recommend, um, of course, you know, vitamin D supplementation um, as appropriate, especially in skin of color individuals who are also wearing sunscreen daily. Great, thank you so much for that super comprehensive answer and also the reminder about vitamin D. A um, uh, comment that came through here, best derm talk I have heard in years. Fantastic. Um, so thank you, Dr. Minitor. Um, thank you. <laughs> absolutely. And here's a question. 
Um, concern for hypopigmentation with topical steroids in our patients with FITS 4 through 6. Any particular recommendations? Yes, so we um, here in Oregon, I mean, we practice in a, um, a very steroid phobic um, atmosphere um, more than other other parts of the, the country. Um, and, you know, individuals with, with skin of color, you know, we really need to counsel on appropriate use of topical steroids, um, you know, choosing the right strength for the, the right body part, right body location. Um, but let's say, for example, we have, you know, an individual of fits type four, they have um, classic atopic dermatitis in the antecubital fossa. We want to prescribe a 0.1% um, triamcinolone. We should discuss that let's say your eczema naturally improves, it gets better on its own or just with a moisturizer. It is very possible that as the skin heals, as that inflammation is cleared by the body, it can leave behind, I call it a footprint in the snow because it's not permanent scarring, but it can leave behind hypopigmentation just as part of healing that will naturally improve over time. It can leave behind hyperpigmentation, which as long as it's well controlled will naturally improve over time. The more permanent hypopigmentation that can happen from overuse of steroids, of course, is also usually accompanied by changes in skin texture, meaning like the cigarette paper thinness, the prominent telangiectasias or blood vessels that you can see in that skin. And you can, by simply kind of eliciting, you know, a very open-minded, non-judgmental history, you can kind of differentiate if a person is overusing the topical steroid. Right. So you would maybe tell them, you know, use it once or twice a day until the skin is smooth, up to two weeks, for example, and then slowly taper down and hopefully off of it as long as they maintain moisturization. And if you can't, you can send them over and we can we can deal with it. But that is an important counseling point in individuals with skin of color is that as part of the inflammation healing, whether you use topical steroids or not, you can get resulting temporary hyper or hypopigmentation. Um, and that hyperpigmentation or hypopigmentation can take three, six, 12 months to improve depending on the location of that hyperpigmentation. Great, thanks so much for those comments. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I'll do my best to interpret, <clears throat> excuse me, this next question. Um, I think it pertains to um, when we're looking at the Fitzpatrick skin types, um, is there a relation to um, distance from the equator um, and elevation? Um, and does the skin, um, type tend to be innate or or shift within a given individual okay um so i maybe kind of getting at the the kind of um evolutionary kind of basis for skin color i think i think perhaps if you had any comments on on how um yeah, any comments on on the skin types one through six um, with with regard to um, perhaps how we best define them and if that has any relation specific to geography in the world. Oh, OK, and OK. If not, we can. Yeah, so let me pull on. that up again. Mm -hmm. Can you can you still see my slides? We can. OK, great. OK, so um, here. So yes, um, I think I understand. Um, so there are, you know, kind of um, when I was preparing this lecture, you know, I kind of read about the kind of the evolutionary kind of selective pressures, you know, that might have selected for certain skin types, you know, at different latitudes. Um, you know, there's, you know, folic acid, um, uh, vitamin D, there's these folic acid theory and vitamin D theory. Um, for um, for why some individuals, you know, with darker skin types and and um, others with lighter skin types, um, you know, but um, I don't know. I'm not answering this question. I don't think I understand the question. I'm sorry. Um, 
I, I think that's just fine, Dr. Miniature, and um, I struggle to ask the question, so perhaps we'll move on to one final question. Okay, um, sorry since, about that. No, no, we truly appreciate it. Um, and so in just our last couple moments, um, I wanted to, to highlight, really appreciate um, your comments that we likely underdiagnose and, and undertreat um, eczema or atopic dermatitis, which may present differently. Um, and a couple of questions to help us out there. Um, how long does it typically take for some of the hyperpigmentation to occur, particularly uh, notable in that photo that we sound, saw in the periocular area? And then also for other presentations such as follicular eczema, does it tend to be intensely itchy or not necessarily? Um, yes, so um, how quickly does the hyperpigmentation develop? It can be immediate and sometimes it's a person's only manifestation of their, of their atopic dermatitis. So that can occur very quickly. Um, if it's in a really photo exposed area, you know, when you treat it, I mean, it could still take months, if not years, to for the hyperpigmentation to fade. But because, you know, classically atopic dermatitis is very itchy, no matter um, the skin color or the follicular variant or not, um, um, uh, you know, you can kind of elicit that history to kind of, if you're not able to tell, okay, is this more active eczema or is this just post-inflammatory uh, hyperpigmentation, um, you know, the person can kind of tell you, oh yeah, it's still itchy. Um, I'm, and if you see any erosions, if you see any vesicles, you know, weeping, this of course points to a more acute inflammatory process, which you could kind of use as other clues as well. Um, and then what was the second part of that question? Just wondering in general with all forms of active uh, atopic dermatitis, um, is itching a characteristic symptom, including the follicular form? Yes, classically, yes. Um, what can be difficult and present a kind of a diagnostic challenge um, with follicular eczema, which I myself, you know, ha can have a difficult time with as well. Um, so I'm just going to put up those pictures here so we can see, um, is that there is something known as uh, lichenoid frictional dermatitis, which is just follicular prominence over bony parts. So like elbows, knees, um, um, yeah, usually the elbows and the knees, where you can pretty much get something that looks just like this, that you see these violaceous, you know, um, hyperpigmented papules there, but the person's like, oh no, that's not itchy, you know, and that, uh, and that can just be that um, just simply from rubbing, it, it can cause lichenification or thickening and darkening of the skin. It's kind of a defense mechanism the skin does, um, and that is not follicular eczema, of course, and, you know, that can be treated if a person wants, but um, with, you know, heavy moisturizers, mild kind of chemical peel creams like urea creams and things like that, but um, that is not necessarily eczema, um, but, it, you know, it's hard. It, you know, it's definitely not an easy thing always. Great, thanks so much. I see we are just past nine o'clock and so we must let you go, Dr. Miniter, but many, many thanks for your expertise um, and advancing all of our learning and our practice in this really important topic. Thank um, you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I really Absolutely. appreciate it. Take care. All right, bye-bye now, thanks.